Okay. Now we're starting the stream. Are we live? Are we live, everybody? I've been trying to start this stream for a little bit now. Seems like the settings have changed. And I've had to update some OBS settings here to get live. Uh, YouTube's looking good. So can I confirm that we're live? Can we confirm? Hello, Naveen Gupta. Hello, Adolfo Hernandez. Hello, everyone else that's yet to come to the live stream. Uh, looks like we're good. Hello, hello from Oregon. Uh, nice to meet you, nice Oregonians out in the northern, uh, northern parts of the United States, northwestern. Uh, I guess Oregon is just one state north of me. Any of you guys that aren't aware, California is on the west coast, which is that way. And Oregon is one state above. Is that a state? Yeah, Oregon is a state, right? And then we have Washington above, uh, north of Oregon. That's where Seattle is. Uh, interesting fact, Seattle is where Microsoft's headquarters are at, as well as Amazon. Um, anyone that wants to work in like the tech industry, there's a couple of different tech hubs around the United States. Obviously the Silicon Valley in the Bay area is one of the largest ones. And then the next one we have is probably like Seattle or New York. Then we have other cities that are great as well, such as Portland and, uh, maybe Austin. So a lot of great places, uh, go ducks. Go uh, Huskies? Is it the Washington Huskies? I have no idea. Uh, UW, UW, UW Huskies, I think. Uh, okay, so what are we at now? Um, any of you guys want to see a funny Twitter, a Twitter comment? I want to, I don't want to roast this guy, but okay, let's roast him anyways. Okay. So here's, here's a message that I get from Twitter and you silly gooses out there on the internet, always asking me these ridiculous questions. Subrat Potty asks, can we, can we take front camera pictures without opening the camera in Swift? Please help. My response to that is, Oh, just apply some magic and you can do it. Any reference, please. I want to know, is it possible? From Subrat Patti. Uh, no roasting on this channel, but how do you expect to open the camera in iOS without either touching Swift or Objective-C? Uh, sometimes, sometimes when you guys ask me these questions, uh, I don't know, are you guys like, hi? Are you guys high on cocaine like me? High on the green, high on the reefer? High on the Mary Jane? How do you guys come up with these excellent questions? How do I open the camera without touching his with? Am I understanding this question wrong? Do I just not understand what he's talking about? I, I, don't, I don't get it. So someone can clarify what that question means. Please do let me know. I get very confused with your guys' comments and questions all the time. Sometimes, I don't know if you're, you guys are just trolling me for fun or if these are very like real serious questions. I don't know. Teach us more video about Swift UI. Yu hao ya soul. Yu hao ya su. Zao. Wo shu yao xie zhong wen cai neng ying xi ni de zhu yi. Rally Durham, uh, also a growing tech hub. Huh, interesting. I, I don't have any strong recollections about Raleigh or the Durham area. This is somewhere in the Midwest, I believe. This is North Carolina. Um, at my very, very first company, working at a traffic mapping software company, uh, there was a big customer in Raleigh Durham that used our traffic software. 
So we uh, we often talked to the Raleigh Durham offices, and that's probably the only reason why I remember this name of the city. Uh, Austin, Texas is getting big. I would like to visit Austin, Texas. If, if anyone's living out there and wants to host me, uh, and uh, let me give a talk maybe on Swift development, maybe I would do it. Uh, uh, your missing professor brain. <laughs> it's a very controversial character. Very controversial character. Storyboard Zebra Swift UI. <laughs> All right, guys, get out all your Swift UI questions. We know, we know you're you're burning. It's burning a deep hole inside that heart of yours, or maybe your brain. And uh, I know you just can't hold hold the question, and you have to ask. Uh, the fastest way to learn iOS. Yes, indeed. Uh, do you want to come through uh, Boston? Uh, so I have a couple of students from, uh, Shanghai that are in, what is it? Pennsylvania and New York city. So yeah, if I visit the, the Northeastern part of the United States, I could come by and visit I'm drunk Chinese again. Are you drinking Bailey's? This does kind of look like Bailey's. Anyone that, <laughs> that doesn't know, I... I believe Bailey's originated as a alcoholic, like creamer, chocolate creamer drink. Uh, but don't quote me on any of this. I might be just talking out of my ass. Uh, so Bailey's is like a creamer that you, I think you just drink it straight up. Uh, come to T.O. What is, where is T.O.? Is this Toronto or? T dot T dot O. I don't know where T O is. Uh, it was a question. What's the fastest way to learn iOS? T dot from uh, Drake Drake's hometown. Good day, mate. Love Resser Brain. Don't worry about the hacks. We can't see the humor in it. Uh, did the professor brain courses get de demonetized? No, um, the, the professor brain videos are, are live and well. He, he's still an interesting part of the channel. If you guys want to check out the previous, the past couple of videos, uh, there's a there, there's a there. Uh, I got kind of tired of doing that character. So maybe I'll bring him back and just piss off everybody again. I don't know. I don't know what that character is going to end up turning into. Oh, please, Professor Brain. I'm starting to learn iOS. Should I learn UI Kit or Swift UI? <laughs> um, so I think uh, the new most frequently asked hated question for Swift channels is do I learn Swift UI or UI kit? That's going to be the most hated question from now on. The, it, it, it's going to replace the previous most hated question, which is, um, should I use react native or flutter versus, uh, Swift? That was a previous question before that. The other question that most people hate is, or at least maybe just me. Now the question is, should I use a storyboard or use programmatic coding? Uh, the question before that is why do you keep using collection views over UI table views? And 
I think that's pretty much my history of being on YouTube. Those are all the questions that I get. And the reason why I don't like it is because I get easily impatient and I get easily annoyed, I think. And yeah, I guess because these questions are asked so frequently that having to answer them over and over, it just gets very tiresome. And it's not really like the, it's no one's fault. Like, obviously you have to ask things that you don't know and you don't know if they've been asked before. This is just the way it is. Should I use React Native or Flutter? I think before, there's gotta be, so I'm gonna make an overlay on this stream right here and maybe I'll put it right here. An overlay that says questions that you don't ask, like FAQ or something. Yeah, there should be a FAQ here. If you go on Twitch, the Twitch streams, the Twitch gamers, they have an FAQ section uh, right below their streams that answers all these questions. I, I need to do that. And there also needs to be, I need to have one of those horn, those horn buzzers. Whenever someone asks one of these questions, I just press the horn. Should you learn Objective C or Swift? Should you learn Objective C or Swift is, it's a very good question. So there's the category of very annoying questions like the Swift UI, React Native, and Flutter ones. And then we have a really good question as, uh, as to, should you even learn Objective C anymore in 2019? Uh, the answer to that is, Objective-C is still a very good language. I was having a discussion with a, a friend the other, the other day about Objective-C. Uh, I'm gonna assume that 95% of you guys have never even opened an Objective-C project before. Maybe that might be wrong, but if you start typing Objective-C code, because it's a extremely statically typed language, you can see how fast the Swift autocomplete is or not the Swift autocomplete, but the Xcode IDE, it really understands what you're trying to type in Objective-C a lot faster than Swift. So previous versions of Xcode, I'm gonna say Xcode 8 or Xcode 9, is just really slow. But in that same version, when you're typing Objective-C code, it's just blazingly fast. And like sometimes I would, whenever I lose syntax highlighting in Swift, I always think to myself, okay, why can't we just go back to Objective C? I don't, I don't need, I don't need all the fancy thing that comes with Swift. I just want fast, autocomplete, uh, consistent syntax highlighting, and I think I'm good to go. I think I'm good to go. Um, yeah. Um, why did you use Golang for your course website? Uh, why did I use Golang? Hmm. So the reason why I chose Golang for my website is the exact same reason why like Twitter started with Rails, uh, why like maybe Facebook is using PHP and why other, you know, startup companies use their, their, their stack technology. It's mostly because of just curiosity. I'm pretty sure like, uh, maybe uh, let's just say Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook and he wrote all the code. Like 
chances are he knew PHP. He had the resources to write the entire website using PHP. And that's what he went with. There's really no... Most of the time when someone decides to use a particular stack, there's really no reason why they do it. It's mostly because they have the resources to understand that stack at that moment in time. And that's the one they chose. There's no like insight as, oh yeah, I compared five different backend technologies and th this is the one that came on top, like, like came out on top. It's, it's usually just the one that you know. At the time I was curious about Golang, I heard where I read on forums how fast it was. So I started prototyping some server logic using Golang and just through curiosity and just typing out a lot of the code, I found that it was pretty easy to understand. Documentation wise, I find that documentation is more difficult to, to read through compared to things like maybe Rails or PHP. But overall, I was also testing like how, how fast the connections and how fast the requests were being served from the Golang server. So yeah. And then at, over time, it evolved from like a prototype project that I just had from, it evolved from that to like, oh, maybe I'll just host my website using Golang. And it, now knowing a, a couple of different other backend technologies, maybe I would use something a little easier. So Golang is really rough. There, there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of like, you know, uh, like packages, readily available packages that you can just download and use. I would, I would appreciate, appreciate that. Like, like in PHP and rails and node, there's just a lot of stuff that's already pre-built up because it's been out there for a while, but that's what you get. Uh, Hatesh Patel with the 20 rupees. Thank you. Um, let's talk about storyboards. Um, all right. So the website's built out using React uh, as a front end, React.js. And then uh, the entire backend's hosted on a Golang server <laughs> that's hosted on Heroku. Uh, let's talk about RIP storyboard. RIP storyboard. <clears throat> let's pour let's pour a drink out for the storyboard and let's may the storyboard rest in pieces and let's honor the father of the kind of the father of iOS development especially in the Swift age and we're going to pour no we're not going to pour it now I have a mouse pad right here I'm not going to pour it on a mouse pad Um, but yeah, let's, let's all kind of say goodbye to the storyboard and for all of the good that it brought us, all of the pros of being able to drag in our cells, drag in image views, labels, and buttons, uh, it, it still serves a very good purpose and for anyone that still wants to use a storyboard, it's still a very, a very, a very, very viable option, even in 2019, 20, 2021. Still a very good solution. Um, and I do recommend that if you're a storyboard developer to use it to its like full extent. It's very powerful, very capable. We made millions of dollars in sales for, for the last startup company, all off storyboard. And yeah, still a great solution. Um, rest, <laughs> rest in spaghetti. Wow. <clears throat> so Romulus says that, uh, read somewhere in comments here recently, someone didn't get job in interview, they used storyboards. 
Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can tell you how my interview went at, at Touch of Modern like five, six years ago and how I landed the job. If you guys are interested, hit a number one and I'll, I'll go through what they asked me during the interview, which should be interesting. Uh, Eudaimonian, Eudaimonian. What do you think of Tech Lead and Joma's new $500 course for tech interviews? I think that's, if, if they can help people get jobs, I think it's great. Um, I know of a, a company that a lot of my friends have studied at and they guarantee, I think it was a 70 or 80% success rate of getting into Facebook as an intern. And take a guess as to how much this place costs. So they train you on all of the interview questions that Facebook will potentially ask you. I think they go over like 50 or 100 questions or maybe like 200 questions in the span of three weeks. Guess how much that costs. All right. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. You're going to think that this $500 course is a good deal. Oh, we got a lot of ones. Okay. You guys want to hear? Okay. Maybe I'll tell you the story. Um, so the guaranteed 80% success rate of the Facebook intern course is, I think it's about 30 K $30,000 for, uh, last I heard, I think it's a six weeks, six weeks course where they, they have like video lectures, live chats. Um, they grade you on how you do on your algorithm questions. And for 30K, they guarantee you a Facebook internship job. Now, keep in mind, um, is it 30K? I think it's 30K. It might be $10,000, but I, I, I remember it being about $30,000. Um, and when you get hired as a Facebook intern, they, the, the salary per year is about eighty dollars to $90,000 as just as an intern. So that's... Uh, Totally worth it. Once you get in as an intern, then you're pretty much set. The $30,000 is like, you'll just make it back within the first year. And then your, your entire future is going to be a Facebook intern, becoming a Facebook software engineer. And then you can get, you can get to places that let's face it. You cannot get into if you were not a Facebook intern or a Facebook, uh, employee. So. 30k i think it's totally worth it so now if you think about the tech lead or the joma course for 500 dollars, if there is a success rate then uh yeah it's totally worth it uh 500 for an online course is a little steep but hey i'm all for like promoting things that are actually successful at doing what they claim to do uh, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the students have paid for a lot of my courses on the website. So some, some students have spent upwards to like three to $400 on everything. Yeah. Maybe like three, $400. Yeah. And they've gotten jobs. So they, you yeah. know, uh, everything works out. You, you have to pay for certain things, which is great. All right. So what was I going to talk about now that I'm rambling about other people's content? Okay. So at touch of modern, when I went in on the, the interview and they wanted to hire an iOS developer, you know, more of a senior ish role to take full control of their iOS platform and pretty much their mobile platform, uh, itself. So they asked me, like, okay, what is your experience in iOS? What do you build your apps in? Do you build it out in code, uh, the interface builder or storyboard or some kind of combination of everything? And then the way I answered that question was for like prototype and very easy screens. What I do is, um, I'll build out this very easy looking screen in a storyboard. And if that's all we need and if everything works with the storyboard prototype, then usually you just keep that. 
Um, now, when things get a little bit complicated and you need to support uh, like a full set of features across multiple screens, then you have to start abstracting things out. Um, so I gave them that answer and um, they kind of knew what they were doing already with iOS development and they agreed with me on that approach. So they then asked me this other question about, okay, do you know Android development? And I told them, yeah, I can also build Android apps too. So once, uh, so what they were looking for was once they fully developed out their iOS app, they also wanted to get into the Android space. So having both of those skill sets, they were like, oh yeah, that's totally like totally great that you know both both sides of the mobile coin. And then the next question they asked me was, okay, what is your experience with like working on the backend server? Because we're a small team, about five engineers, we can't we can't really handhold people on how to figure out what the server is doing. There's a lot of code there and it's a little messy, so you have to figure out how to go through, uh, how to go through the server code just by yourself. Like there's going to be someone to tell you, you know, ex somewhat what's going on. And then I told them, yeah, I've done backend server development as well at the previous jobs and it's not going to be a problem. Like going through Rails code is, uh, it's, it's a little new, but I've done it in the past. So, you know, oh yeah, that's great. You know how to do iOS, Android, and you can go through backend, uh, backend technologies on your own. So after that, they asked me this question called uh, the seeds of Eurathenes. I don't know if you guys know this question, but it's like how to find all the prime numbers from one to a thousand or one to N. So... I initially didn't know how to solve that algorithm question, um, but it's not really like, it's not really whether or not you know how to solve it, but I kind of wrote a rough algorithm at first, and then I needed to determine whether or not a number was prime or not. And so after like various back and forth with the interviewer, I was able to come up with a workable solution, and then that was it. Uh, and all during that time, I was already, I had a contracting job at the time. I didn't actually want to work anywhere full time because I had been working like eight years, eight consecutive years. Then throughout that eight years, I never had a vacation or never had a break. So I, I quit my last job, took on a contract job. Uh, I wasn't really looking to get full time again. So what happened was when I was walking out the door of Touch of Modern, the office, the uh, the head of HR like stopped me as I was heading to my car, and then she gave me the offer like on the spot, and I told her like, um, I told her like, yeah, thanks, but I don't really want to work full time just yet. So I told her I might I might work again in like three or maybe half a year. And then she was like, okay, uh, how about we offer you some more money? And if you want more money, we can give it to you. We, we have the budget. And so after some negotiation, I was like, okay, maybe this might be an interesting job that I can uh, work on for the next year or two. And so that's kind of why I, I started working at that job. Yeah. It's a... It's a great, uh, it's a great way to get in if you if you expand your skills beyond iOS. So to include Android and backend. Um, once you have that full stack experience, then you're you're good to go. Yeah, <clears throat> there's a video about like the salary and stuff. So if anyone's interested in salary, there's a video on it. Um, he is 35. Uh, uh, some sort of discount to help us buy more of your courses. Um, I don't have any discounts right now on the website. 
I, I haven't been able to think of an easy way to program that into the, the back end. Like, I have a couple of ideas, but I don't I don't want to spend time doing that right now. Uh, storyboards are an excellent starting point. Yep. 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 Okay. <laughs> Plans for Flutter. Thoughts on Flutter. Okay. Get out the Flutter questions, guys. Get them out. Get them out as well as the uh, the Swift UI questions. I know you got them. I know you're you're ready to fire them off. <laughs> Chinese accent, please. The Chinese accent. Uh, let's see. We had a couple of. Let's see. Uh, we had a super chat. Jugal Shah. Jugal Shah, thank you for this uh, super chat. Sorry, I didn't get to this earlier. Uh, uh, health app. Maybe I need to buy an Apple Watch first, and then I'll truly understand the, the usefulness behind like a health app. Uh, the pattern. I'm interested in your Tinder Firestore course. How fluent in Swift uh, I have to be in order to follow it. Um, if you're able to follow the stuff, the content that's already on this channel, then you shouldn't have you shouldn't have too much trouble. But maybe that's asking a little bit too much. I like I still walk through everything line by line. And if you can follow code line by line, then it, it should be fine. But um, do let me know if you find the course too too difficult. The thing I hate, like uh, <laughs> maybe hate's a really strong word, but I very much dislike going through, uh, I don't like going through courses and lessons like a standard traditional university class where you first uh, I don't know spend 30 minutes talking about theory and talking about things that you don't even care about and then at the last 10 minutes the professor decides to give you some example that you uses the theory that he just blabbed on for half an hour like I I don't like doing that style of of lectures and that's kind of what I would call backwards teaching. And instead of doing that, you should really show like the lesson in a way where you introduce topics slowly one by one uh, as the students need the new like concept. This is why Ray Wenderlich, uh, their websites, their, their, their blog posts are so great. They don't over explain things at the very beginning. Uh, Hassem Jamek, uh, if you are, I'm going to ban you if you are, uh, going to post your, your website again. So if you want to get banned, then, uh, post it one more time and you are going to get banned. Um, yeah. I guess there aren't any rules on this chat, but there's no promotional content of any kind. Uh, do I still remember anything from your, uh, from my applied math courses in school? Yeah, I remember some stuff. The more interesting courses were, uh, were the courses where I took like simulation and they kind of teach you if you have this large factory or maybe this large business and you want to simulate having maybe 10 employees inside of this company, if your 10 employees are doing X, Y, and Z, how to optimize it so that uh, the overall production of this company can be maximized. So things like that were interesting. 
the uninteresting courses were like a linear algebra, how to solve this equation using something. I don't, I don't find that stuff very interesting. Uh, am I going to update my courses on Swift UI? Well, uh, eventually, maybe. Swift UI is such a different paradigm that it's going to take everyone really really a long time to, to finally understand what Swift UI is capable of. And the code is not even set in the stone yet. Uh, $3,000 US per month as a full stack developer. React.js, Go, Node.js, Python, Swift, Kotlin, Java, Kubernetes. That's a lot of languages for one job. So why would you use Go, Node.js, and Python in one job? That sounds like a lot. If you're using so many different technologies at once, then I don't think you're going to be good at any one of them. Um, so right now, I know a lot of people are asking for like Flutter, Flutter content and Android content. The thing that's really, uh, you really need to motivate someone to make these things, right? And I don't really have a huge motivation towards that. So maybe if I just put out, uh, I'll just put out paid, like paid courses on the website for anyone that wants to learn it. And then I'll, I'll announce it when it's ready. Otherwise I don't feel like putting all that stuff on, on the channel. Yeah. All right, here's a here's another uh, excellent troll question. Am I getting trolled by Apple developer? Where should I learn coding? Should I learn Swift and Swift UI or just one of those frameworks? Uh, maybe I kind of I kind of uh, I'm just. What was the saying? I laid my bed or I made my bed and now I have to sleep in it. Whatever that phrase is. I think maybe I put out too much Swift UI content at the very beginning and now everyone's expecting uh, Swift UI to take over the world. And yeah, I, I, I agree. A lot of that is kind of my own fault. And now everyone's asking me as if I was the, the Swift UI guru. Don't claim to be. And I think I should pre preface all those videos with one large warning saying, Swift UI is in beta. You don't want to learn this right now. This is just beta technology. It's exciting, but you still have to get to your everyday jobs of using UI kit, standard UI view controller development. Uh, I think I should have prefaced every video with that one large warning comment. That would have helped. I think that would have helped. Uh, I made my bed and now I have to lay in it. Is that the phrase? Man, that's a, um, uh, Obata Dark's knee, Dark's and Lily. Your tutorials helped me uh, kickstart my iOS development career two years ago and now I don't really know what to learn next. Um, the, the internet is your oyster. The world is your oyster. The internet is your oyster. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I also felt that way once upon a time, maybe like five, 10 years ago. Sometimes you run into this dead end where you don't know which which kind of topics you want to learn. Um, I don't feel that way anymore, and I haven't felt that way for the past five years. Uh, I think the, the realization is that 
you kind of realize you don't have enough time in the day to learn everything that's on the internet. So you just have to pick one and you learn that one day or one week and then you move on. For me personally, I don't build anything that that doesn't interest me. So if it's an interesting topic, I'll learn how to build it. Like, you know, that's, that's how I operate, but maybe that's not for everyone. 你好,你好,老师你好,你好,能不能讲解一下怎么用UI <laughs> Uh, did you suffer from procrastinating when you were at school? I do that all the time. Um, procrastination is, it's a natural, it's a natural habit that we have as human beings because, you know, we don't want to waste too much effort for things that we don't deem very valuable in life. So procrastination is just, um, it's just us as human beings not knowing how to pri- not knowing how to prioritize things in in life. I think I think to solve prior uh, to solve procrastination, you have to know what's valuable at you know right now, the time right now. And I still procrastinate all the time. In school, I used to I used to procrastinate there were like classes that I didn't even do the final projects and that's how bad it, it was and I failed out of those courses I failed a lot of courses in college for anyone that isn't aware um, yeah Yeah. If anyone wants to know about why I failed the courses, why I, co- I failed my college courses, type a one in the chat. Did I make my decision about working for Google? Uh, I never responded again with, uh, with the Google person. So I guess maybe, maybe I can email google again to ask i'm curious about like the salary of that position but aside from that um this channel does pretty well courses sell pretty well and i get to be my own boss Uh, i don't have to really listen to anyone at the same time you know i don't really have a team here to collaborate with which kind of sucks so there's there's strange, strange problems. 老师,您找女朋友吗? <laughs> 怎么那么搞笑? Um, friend is getting 280k as level 4 at Google. You might be placed into level 5 as a senior. Yeah. Even 280k, I would... I don't even know if I would take that position or even higher. I wouldn't, I don't know if I would take it. I don't think I would actually. Uh, so back in the day when I was in college, I just hated all of my courses. Like professors were boring. I didn't know what the hell I was learning most of the time. Reading textbooks, super boring. Uh, very, very difficult to understand textbooks, the content, you know, how to prove some kind of set is finite or so there's like courses in discrete math and, uh, you talk about set theory, like it's so dumb. It's so dumb. And there was a phase in college where I was just super depressed about, you know, whether or not the major that I picked was the right one. Uh, a lot of the courses were just theory based courses that totally not practical in real life. So I realized later on that, um, I only learn things that I find uh, useful in the real world. So, you know, thinking back on that now, I probably picked the wrong, the wrong courses to take or maybe in the wrong major. 
And so I procrastinated a lot, uh, didn't understand most of the things that were going on in, in lecture, uh, nor did I feel like I wanted to go to the professor and ask the professor, you know, what exactly he meant during this, uh, during like lecture one, two, three, and all the lectures before that. So I ended up like failing out a lot of the courses that just I didn't like taking. And after years and years of just seeing this pattern, you realize how uh, you realize how school is mostly it's redundant. I would say. I would say it's it's more it's more like for people that don't have a direction in life, then school is pretty useful. I had. Before I had started college, I had already been doing what I'm doing now, actually. So I already had a direction in my life. I just didn't know how to take my direction and actually be a professional at it. And school didn't help. So kind of hated, hated school for that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that a lot, of, a lot of students here on this channel probably experienced some of that during their college years. And you're probably experiencing it right now. Um, there's not much I can say for college students that that'll help them. Just know that college is like going through like five levels of hell. And each level of hell gets progressively worse. And then once you get through the fifth level of hell, you finally have your graduation um, documents. What do you call that? Your graduation papers? And once you have that, I think you're ready to head into the real workplace and get a job and uh, start coding for the rest of your lives. For some reason, this is the pattern or this is this is the tradition that we develop in the in the world. I think everywhere in the world we have this tradition. It's pretty stupid. Uh, yeah. Uh, my GPA was pretty bad. I think I had like somewhere around like a 2.9 or a 3.1 or something like that. Was it? Yeah, I think it was like a low, low threes, but it was UC Berkeley. So it was a pretty hard school. Even the smartest, the smartest students in, in my circle, they didn't have a high GPA. It was very hard to get all the A's in uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, do I have time to work out, spend time with my family? How much free time do I get? Uh, right now as a YouTuber and online personality, I have a lot of free time. And I, I mean, I say I, ha I have a lot of free time, but I spend most of the free time on putting out courses, lessons, and online content. And it's something that I enjoy doing. Uh, but at the same time, it is it is what we all consider work. You know, maybe not the worst job in the world, but uh, at the same time, it's still work. So uh, that's what I do. Um, being your own boss has its pros and cons. Uh, should I go to a boot camp? How many of you guys are like boot camp graduate students? I would be curious if uh, any of you guys have attended or even thought about going to a boot camp. Uh, I used to teach, I taught one, uh, one, what would we call it? We called it a cohort. And so basically like one unit of 20 students. I, I taught that for 13 weeks. It was fun. It's kind of stressful, but it was fun. <laughs> okay, MPI was dead. 
Uh, is it better to learn coding from YouTube, Udemy courses, or reading manuals? And should I memorize the code and learn exactly everything of a book? Uh, so here's the interesting part about programming that a lot of people don't really understand until five years after they're employed in a company and after they've been coding every day for five years. And the interesting fact is that you start to understand programming is, uh, it's not like being a doctor. So if you're a doctor, right, I would, I would expect that a doctor reads journals and journals and just a ton of medical related journals and they keep up to date with the latest research and they are like an encyclopedia of knowledge. They can just recall information really, really quickly. And whenever they like, they have a patient that has a certain disease or certain symptoms, they know what that symptom is related to and they can diagnose this person with a problem really, really quickly. Uh, and then on the flip side, computer programming is the exact opposite. You, you're expecting not to know an encyclopedia of information in your head and what you're expected to, to the skill that you're expected to have is you need to be a really good, uh, Google searcher. You know what to type into Google to figure out your, the solutions to your problems. And, uh, then you're also expected not to memorize anything. So if you learn from YouTube, if you learn from Udemy, then those are going to be your resources. But uh, for the most part, YouTube and Udemy are like pretty bad. I would say pretty bad resources. Well, what is it? It's really bad. Maybe that's not the correct word. Uh, maybe very introductory, yeah. Uh, YouTube content is like, it's pretty good. Udemy content is very introductory. Well, maybe that's not true either, but that's kind of the impression that I get. Like when you're working on a real job, the type of code that you look at is so much more complex than what you see on YouTube and Udemy. And that's just how it is because no one's going to be able to share their company source code. So you de you de manian, you de you de manian. I'm in a boot camp. Yeah, I would like to go to a boot camp. There is not one in my area. Uh, Kenny says I was thinking about going to boot camp, but decided to go to university instead. I went boot camp, but didn't learn anything. Yep, that happens as well. I think everyone in this video or this chat should like the video. I don't like the way bootcamp is sometimes advertised like 12 weeks. You will be coding. You'll be this coding genius in reality. Maybe just enough to get you into entry level. Hmm. But I have, I have some issue with this statement and I agree. I agree with this statement, but I have some issues with it. So boot camps are advertised in a way so that they can profit right so they're going to guarantee you something they're going to try to guarantee you that you get a job at the very end of the 12th week and what a lot of boot camps realize is that that was an impossible an impossible guarantee so later on they evolved their marketing statement to be okay after you take this boot camp within half a year, within half a year after you graduate, you ha you're gonna have a success rate of getting a job at maybe 90%. And then later on, they kind of realized that, that that didn't work either. A lot of their students were graduating, but they the students weren't getting any jobs. And later on, what happened was, um, they quickly realized that None of their students were getting any jobs after graduating these boot camps. Like they were all failing out. Uh, and there's, you can attribute this to a lot of different reasons and they're not even related to boot camps actually. Uh, like a lot of students heard about these kind of get rich quick schemes. And so people that had no business in 
joining these boot camps, paid enough money, paid the tuition to join the boot camp, and so they got a spot. They sat through the courses for 12 weeks, and then they, you know, didn't try their hardest, if at all, and so they weren't able to get a job. And you have a bunch of those guys ruining the stats. Um, I would say that if you have a chance to go to a boot camp, you have to set your expectations correctly. Expectations for a boot camp is you try your hardest for the 12 weeks. And if you try your hardest and you give it an honest effort, uh, you are on your way to getting an entry level job. Now, would I, would I hire anyone that graduated from my boot camp after I taught it for 13 weeks? in 2015 if i asked myself would i hire any of those students i would say out of the the what was it 12 or 15 students we had total i think i maybe i would hire about six of those students yeah so a little under like roughly half of those students i would give an entry level job like without question, I would I would give them entry level jobs because I know I can see a couple of things. They try very hard, very intelligent, able to understand new concept uh, new concepts very quickly, and they were smart enough to the point where uh, they didn't require too much hand holding. And oftentimes when they came to me with questions. Um, there were very, very smart questions and I didn't really have to explain in too much detail. Like I just have to say one or two words, keywords, and then they can, they can take those keywords and they go, Oh, okay. I see. I see. Then they just, uh, kind of go back to their, their computers and then they can knock out the solution in half an hour. So you can see like intelligence very quickly. Uh, because taking a course of Angela Yu on Udemy and iOS 12, I think she's probably one of the better, better online course instructors. Uh, I've only seen some of her like introduction videos, so I can't really say too much about how her content is structured. It's probably good. It feels more like a traditional boot camp. Yeah. Um, yeah. The content that I put out on on this channel and on my website is not exactly boot like boot camp style. It's more like, oh, you want to build this thing? Here's exactly how you do it. And through that process is where you get like all these insights about what components to use and what the Swift language actually, you know, what it actually is. Uh, Bob, the developer has a nice intermediate course on Udemy. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of good content. Ange, Angela is the most beginner course. Yeah. I'm going to say like 99% of the content out there is like very, is what you would call introductory. Uh, yeah. And again, I, I really dislike, I dislike focusing on introductory concepts. So anyone that watches my stuff, I don't explain, I don't explain what a let variable is or what an optional is. You just use it and you get used to it. Max code, Max codes has some good content. show us your Tinder profile. Maybe one of these days, if you swipe enough, if you turn your settings onto a female within the age range of, what did, what did I put it on? Like 25 and over, 
turn your settings onto that and then also move move to the california area and move like 50 miles away from me and then maybe you'll you'll get my tinder profile on maybe we can match Do you think Apple documentation is friendly enough for beginners? Uh, didn't I do a video on this like a couple of days ago? <laughs> what happened to auto layout with Swift UI? Uh, Auto layout was like a doomed concept. Let me describe to you the entire auto layout thing. Uh, so Apple decided to come out with this auto layout system to support the iPad, to support the iPhone and iPad apps. Uh, so iPhones had one like iPhone 5 size at the very beginning, and then there was this large iPad size. So in order to support both of these resolutions, you have to use like auto layout to make sure you fill up the, the spaces in between these two different sizes. And then Apple introduced uh, the iPhone 6, 6 Plus, and then later on the 7 and then the 10, right? So now uh, you don't have just two sizes, but more like five different sizes between all the Apple devices that you can develop for. So auto layout is meant to support everything that Apple has offered in terms of their devices. So, uh, you know, after you, after you program an auto layout for four or five years, you realize this, this thing is like total shit. And you either write a lot of constraints in the storyboard or you write a lot of uh, constraints in programmatic code. And then the other thing that you realize is 99% of layout is just a horizontal thing with a vertical thing, and then maybe some embedded horizontal things with some flexible vertical things. You realize that 99% of layouts are just that. And Android actually realized this way before, uh, did they? I guess the Android, team and the Apple team also realized this around the same time. So Apple realized it and they released this thing called a UI stack view that was horizontally and vertically uh, oriented. And then they decided to take the UI stack view and then they now use that to lay out everything in Swift UI. So, uh, Anyone that's wondering what the hell happened to auto layout, this is kind of the story. Auto layout, it's like unnecessarily complicated. Uh, so about a rather personal question, if I may, where do, uh, where do I see my career in five years? Um, haven't really thought about that too much. I mean, I've obviously have, you know, maybe considered what I'd be doing. Um, I think being an online personality, being an online instructor is a pretty easy pretty easy job and it's pretty relaxing you get to go on as many vacations as you want um, the only thing that you have to worry about is whether or not your content is affecting as many people as as you want to so I, in five years I think I let's not talk about five years let's say the next year like I want to produce I want to produce a wider variety of, of courses. 
Uh, something that I kind of dislike doing right now is just doing everything in Swift. Because personally, I work in like five different language, uh, languages and I build websites, Android apps, backend uh, servers, you know, store data in databases and then support all this stuff. Just, just writing everything in Swift is kind of boring, is, is my opinion. Uh, Chang Jeffrey, you might answer this question already. Uh, what courses am I working on right now? Uh, so let's talk about something that I want to release on the, the channel. Maybe in a week, I'm still preparing a lot of this content. I don't know if you guys know this, but preparing lessons is kind of time consuming. So what do we got here? Okay. So something that I've been working on for the past like three days is a new project here that is, uh, it's kind of like a full stack project. So what you see on the left is uh, Node.js. So a lot of this code I'll, I'll release pretty soon. Um, but this server here allows us to build a uh, build a front end website. And if you want to refresh here, you're going to get all these posts objects inside of your website. Uh, if you want to create a new post, so hello from YouTube. This is the best channel on earth. Uh, why do you even question this? Are you out of your mind? You must be. Okay, and now if I have this post, this should refresh with that post. Uh, you see on the right side, we have the iOS app open as well. All this data is being stored in a database. Uh, it's not important what database it is, but if I refresh this right here, you see hello from YouTube, right? It's above this Zion Williamson post. And if I refresh this, you'll see this at the very top here. So you see hello from YouTube. And uh, this is all working just through very, very simple code. There's a lot of files in here, but there's not really a ton that's going on. And once you have this, this server up, you can just launch it onto Heroku. And then you have a fully, function, a fully functioning uh, a backend server that you can support any type of app you want. So you can support a front-end website that looks like this or you can support a iOS app. Uh, if you want to support an Android app, that's also uh, very easy to do. Everything is just a REST API. Now, if I delete, let's delete this one. So I'm gonna delete this. So that is deleted. If I refresh this, that this one up here should be deleted. So, and we have Zion Williamson. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't know when I'm gonna have this ready, but I'm gonna hopefully have something, something demoable in the next couple of days, and I'll I'll try to I'll try to shoot some some lessons for the channel in uh, let's say end of next week. Maybe I'll have the very first lesson up and ready. There's just a lot of other things, like other secondary promotional content that I want to develop first. Ah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, so some questions here about uh, what about Firebase hosting? So this is just... Uh, so Firebase is like an okay technology. And obviously I have a couple of courses on Firebase. Uh, I don't really have a strong opinion on what kind of backend you use. I personally like to have my own uh, custom server. It's because everything is just so much faster in terms of development time and you can update your code here and it just updates automatically, like refreshed without you having to wait 10 seconds or 20 seconds. So, and obviously because I know how to do this stuff, it's easier for me. But if you don't know how to build out a backend, then Firebase is, might be the easier solution. Uh, and yeah, I don't like Firebase for production. Would rather have MySQL on my own dedicated server. Yeah, same thing. 
Uh, I would rather host my own data in my own database somewhere else. Uh, using MySQL makes it very easy to analyze your own data. Um, sales is what I'm using on the left side. And yeah, it's, it's just as easy. I'm currently using MongoDB uh, to host the data. But if you want to switch over to MySQL, you just change one line of code and all your data is hosted. So it's all very, very similar. Lausher,你在哪里学中文?我在网上学中文的。um what about back-end costs uh cheaper on heroku um so for my server so the website if you guys are interested in like how much my website currently costs so let's build that app.com if you calculate everything uh everything excluding like Amazon costs, because Amazon costs are kind of unpredictable. But uh, hosting let's build that app.com, there's like an $80 uh, SSL certificate that you have to pay every year. And then there's the Heroku uh, hosting cost per month is about $30 for, uh, for the server that you get in addition to a couple of different like add-ons, so $30. And then I also say Amazon costs like S3 and what is it? Do I just use S3? I think I just use S3 from Amazon. Uh, that's about $20 a month. So altogether it's very, it's very cheap. It doesn't cost more than like 60, $70 per month to host an entire server that generates, you know, money. Yeah, that's great. That's great. You know, I've worked at a company where the, the server costs are like a couple of thousand dollars a month. Like at Touch of Modern. Uh, the first time I saw the Touch of Modern uh, Amazon bill, I was like, oh my God, we pay this much money for just this these couple of servers that we have. So uh, I was kind of shocked. And then at, oh my God, at uh, App Dynamics, we hosted our, uh, our SaaS everything that we had as, as a SaaS offering for our customers was hosted on Amazon servers. Oh my God. So app dynamics ended up being like a $5.6 billion acquisition from Cisco. Oh my God. You can only imagine how much the EC, EC2 and the AWS bill like every month. Oh my God. We're not, we're not talking about just a thousand dollars, not even talking about just $10,000 for the EC2 bill. You can imagine. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We have. Um, uh, did I cash out when Ab Dynamics got acquired? Yep, I did, and uh, earned a lot of. Uh, I earned some pretty decent money from the acquisition but definitely not as much as other people did at the, at the company. Like some people made a couple million dollars. I, I earned nowhere close to that. Uh, nah, I wish I was, but so what is SaaS? So SaaS is a S A A S is software as a service. So basically Heroku is kind of like a, a SaaS offering, I guess. Heroku calls themselves a, a BaaS. So it's a back end as a service. Uh, what's a good SaaS? Like uh, Trello, Trello.com, the place where you write your tasks. So Trello is kind of like a, a SaaS service. I guess SaaS service is a little redundant. Um. But yeah, making the, like cashing out, I think everyone was required to cash out. So we had to pay out, man, the taxes, the taxes that year, a little crazy. 
Uh, Slack is also a SaaS. Yep. Yes, indeed it is. Yeah. So back to the, the backends, the backend content. Uh, yeah. This is something that I've been wanting to release for the longest, longest time. You should do a YouTube collaboration with David Zhang. Uh, who the heck is David Zhang? Uh, he probably doesn't know who I am, and I don't know who he is either. I think I've seen that name before. Uh, is Dr. Brain in the house? Dr. Brain. Is Dr. Brain in the, in the house? Is he in the house? Slack just went IPO, so many rich people, yeah. Yeah. Um, I visited the Slack office last year. Uh, a lot of, a lot of offices in that single office is like a lot of nice areas where you can just chill, relax, free food. It's kind of, it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice working at a company. Uh, Siraj Raval. Yeah, I, I do know Siraj. Uh, Siraj is a, a very, very like, he's not a quiet person, but he's one of those people that when he talks, he has this very deep tone, deep voice. I think that's Siraj. And when he does say something, it's very interesting what he says. Like a very, very intelligent sounding person. I didn't work with him, but I talked with him. He's one of the earlier, earlier programmers that that joined the company. Uh, I did not participate in hackathons. <laughs> Hello, Patrick. Patrick. Patrick Bellot. Bello. How do you pronounce that last name? Bella. Bella. Bello. Or is it Bellot? Um. Yeah. The the thing about uh, I think hackathons are really helpful. The actual the the actual thing, the concept that you build out during the hackathon is not that important. It's more about getting to know a couple of different people and working in a team, deciding on which part of the project that you want to work on, and then actually building out something that's useful. So it's just being in that environment is helpful. What you actually build out is like not that important. Uh, oh, here's a question that I have never received before. Uh, what you recommend learning before entering computer science? Uh, if I can go back in time like 20 years and tell myself, okay, you're gonna be a programmer for the rest of your life. Here's what you need to learn. Um. I would say the main thing you want to focus on is uh, learn how to declare variables. Then you want to learn how to manipulate arrays. And then you know how to, you got to know how to write functions. And like you don't need to know all this stuff in deep, deep detail, but at least get a surface level knowledge at, at the, to the point where you can actually type out the code yourself and you know start manipulating things. So there's variables, arrays, uh, hash maps, also known as dictionaries in, in iOS. And then there's functions. And once you get all those four concepts down, uh, you're gonna wanna look into like what exactly is object-oriented programming, what are classes, what are interfaces, what are abstract classes. Um, and again, this stuff is useful like it's not exactly useful in real life until later, later, later on. But when you're taking lectures in college, this is very, very useful. Uh, and if you have enough time, uh, do some study on what exactly is a recursive algorithm and what is recursion. So if you can nail down these, these topics, 
you can probably skip college altogether, really. Honestly, you can skip college if you if you if you know how to operate this stuff. Like college is kind of useless. Like I, I didn't learn. I think uh, for me, only my first like three courses in computer science and at UC Berkeley. If I could just take those three courses and then leave college entirely, I would do that. If I were to do it all over again, I don't even care about graduating from UC Berkeley anymore. Uh, I think I talk a lot of shit about colleges and uh, rightfully so. There's so many people graduating now that having a degree means it means a lot less than what it meant 10 years ago. That's that's as a cold heart fact right now. Uh, so I, w I wouldn't go back to college if I had choice. There's like, you know, there's like, so I don't know what that question absolutely means, but uh, I would never go back to college now as a 35 year old. There's no way for that I would go back to college because I'm just horrible college student. Um, if I if I were to go back like 15 years when I graduated, would I go back to college then? Like in 2019, if the landscape, the landscape of the internet looked like this right now, I don't know if I would actually go to college. <laughs> so James Kim, I, I believe I mentioned this earlier. You say that you don't like how in college the professor discusses about theory for most of the class and only spends 15 minutes demoing on how to start the course project. Yep. That's what I also hated the most. The biggest issue about computer science lectures is that, is that um, you need the entire lecture in video format so that you can go back to it and rewatch some of the stuff the professor says. And when I was attending UC Berkeley, they had just started to film stuff and started to put things on the internet. I would assume that the technology for that is a lot better now. But yeah, having video, video playback of courses is just so helpful. I just don't like lecture-based classes. You don't learn anything unless you do uh, do things do things hands-on. Yep, that's also what I that's I wholeheartedly one hundred percent agree with that. And for the most part, that's why I put out these lessons. I want to make it as as hands-on and as like real world as it can possibly be. Um, yeah. Okay. Enough bashing on colors. Uh, do you think UI kit will still be used for a long time or so UI will take over UI kit? Peter, Peter Ivich. Oh, the lovely Swift UI questions. The lovely, lovely Swift UI questions. Anyone else with the Swift UI questions? Um, okay. How quickly will the Swift UI questions take over the React Native and Flutter questions? I think it's it's already taken over. You don't get any of the, the, the React Native questions anymore. Which people also love to, uh, to ask. No more code versus storyboard questions. Uh, surprisingly, I haven't gotten those storyboard versus coding questions all that much because anyone that joins the channel they already know that I don't use storyboard and that question gets uh, filtered out rather quickly. Um, yeah, UI kit's going to be here for, uh, 2023. I don't see Swift UI taking, taking over anytime soon. Like, Next four years, we'll still be on UI, UI kit. Um, I can see the, the, 
<laughs> the usage of storyboards declining over time. So funny, <laughs> just look at how fast the iOS landscape has changed. I wouldn't say that it's changed a whole lot. I would say that Swift UI has introduced or is it so every year Apple's WWDC uh their their conference they don't announce like a ton of uh groundbreaking information but this year they like went balls to the wall and went all out giving you everything that you can even ask for like the new the new mac <clears throat> the new mac pro the display the monitor swift ui now there's also like a ton of other stuff like catalyst for ipad and mac os tech oh my god and then there's also like Swift UI for watch apps. Uh, and then there's also combined framework, which is now integrating, you know, what we all know as React, RX Swift, React, React style programming. Oof, that's a lot to go through, a lot to go through. And it's great that they finally decided to release uh, more of what we can call a standard now, you know, MVVM programming, MVC. They never even like claimed to be MVC for this entire time. But now, now on during their live sessions at WWDC, they're, they're like not physically, but they're recommending MVVM for everyone. Like they explicitly recommend it. I think most companies will stick with UIKit, but once UI, uh, Swift UI gets out of beta, I think there will be teams looking to transition as a fork, maybe. I wouldn't be surprised if we see 80% of apps by mid-2021. Uh, I think 80% is, is quite a... a quite, quite the overestimate. 2021 was that three years from now 80 percent of apps uh, I, would, I would guess closer to like maybe 40 percent remember a lot of the tech that we have now will be looked at as as legacy architecture and just like any other legacy project you have to you have to maintain it. There's still a lot of Objective-C projects that we still have to maintain. Same thing with the Swift UI kit stuff. You just have to maintain it. And we all we all talk about trying to migrate these projects over to new new technology, but that rarely happens. Okay, let me check on what's going on with the stream. And it looks like we have uh, 69 people left in the chat. Yeah, you can you can take Java as, as an example. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna end this stream with three questions. Okay, we're gonna do three questions. And I want you guys to answer these three questions. Uh, I'm gonna start releasing like full stack content. So this means uh, how to write a custom server, how to support your own database, that you, you know, you might purchase a database from Amazon or Heroku, doesn't matter. And uh, full stack has a front end on the web and also an iOS component and then the back end custom server component. Uh, hit a one, <laughs> hit a one in the chat if you wanna see more of full stack style content. So I'm gonna try to move away slightly from Firebase because, you know, I think we all know there's limitations to Firebase. So if you want to see more full stack content, let me see a one in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna see, so we have quite a few people. Yeah, nice. 
and full stack. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> it looks like everyone's in agreement here. There's a consensus that full stack is great. Um, so I don't really have a preference on the full stack database. So out of you guys that do know databases, do you want to see this in Mongo or MySQL or Postgres? And so if you want to see Mongo, if you want to see Mongo, hit a capital A. If you want to see MySQL, hit a capital B. If you don't care, hit a C. Okay, so Mongo is A, MySQL is B, or just type in whatever you want to see. Okay, so we have we have some A's, we have some B's, we have some A's, we have some, so a lot of Mongo. So it looks like Mongo. <clears throat> Wow. Uh, so it looks like a fair mix, which is what I would expect. Um, okay, good. Uh, the sales framework that that comes with that does, that comes with Node. Uh, it's very easy to switch back. So, okay, that's good. Okay, so third question is: Does anyone care about content outside of this? So let's say Android content and Flutter content. I'm never going to be doing React Native. Okay, if you care about Android or Flutter, hit a one. If you don't care about Android or Flutter, hit a two. Okay, so one means that you do care. Okay, so one means you care about Flutter and Android. Two means that you don't care. I think I, I specified that correctly. But, okay, so again, uh, we're seeing a mix. We're seeing a mix. Um, the nice thing about building out a custom backend server is that you're just gonna build a REST API that is going to spit out JSON and you can consume that because JSON is so universal. You can consume that with Flutter and Android very easily. Um, okay. And uh, the backend architecture, I'm gonna use Node.js. Uh, the framework that I'll use is called Sales MVC. Uh, the reason why I'm using Sales is because personally to me, it resembles Rails a lot and it's very easy to get up and running. And I'll be also providing, I'll be providing uh, sort of a starter project. Yeah, yeah, I'll be providing a starter sales repository. This way I don't have to build out some of the foundational basic stuff that, you know, let's just face it, I, I don't, I don't wanna do the foundation stuff every time. Stick with native iOS. Uh, iOS Mongo Noon. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll be sticking with, uh, at least in the very beginning, I, I, I'll i do iOS and the front end. Um, <laughs> we do not care about Android. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I believe I mentioned this at the very beginning of when I started the channel, which is uh, the best the best shot that you'll have at getting a job is is knowing one primary skill and then about two or three secondary skills. So if you want to become an iOS developer, the primary skill is to know iOS and know Swift UI kit very well. And then the secondary skill is to either know uh, custom backend or Android development. It's probably best if you know everything, like if you know iOS really well and then you know backend and Android. But obviously we're all limited with the time that we can spend on this stuff. 
So picking one of those two would be would be wise. Uh, focusing on solely Swift and iOS development, uh, that's not the best thing to do. Anyone that tells you this is like, mm, what is this? Anyone that tells you this is probably, probably hasn't been coding for five or 10 years and probably hasn't seen what a real large company looks like. When you're working in a large company, you work with a lot of teams. So having to know various technologies is super, super important. In order to advance in your career, you're going to need to work with, be the lead that communicates with everyone. So you have to know how everything works. That's just, that's just how, what it feels like at large companies. And obviously not, not everywhere is going to be like this, but the best shot of you advancing in your career is the more you know, the better. And that's, that's what I've set out to do ever since the conception of this channel. And, uh, I know I keep saying this, but eventually we'll get there. Eventually we'll get there. <laughs> um, so this, uh, I don't know if you saw this earlier, but. I kind of demoed it a little bit. So here is the full stack stuff. So on the left side is just VS code with sales. Uh, I guess I'll move the chat to the left side here. And uh, we have the front end, which is built using, this is not even React. This is just what sales comes with. And uh, you know, you have your post here and let's see. Hello, hello, Peter, Peter Ivich. Do you want to learn full stack development with the rest of us? Uh, I know you don't care about Android development, but you know, some of us actually like Android and Kotlin. So this means maybe I'll put out some uh, Android related lessons. All right, so here is the post title and here is the actual uh, body of the text. I'm gonna hit the post, it's going to be entered right in the back. So post, we have this uh, right in the back. Um, maybe I'll support images as well, but maybe not. I don't know exactly the extent of this entire thing, but you have your post here. You see this right here, I'm going to refresh and you'll see the, the new post. So post is right here, click into that. And you can edit this as well. So let's say you want to, uh, Mr. Peter Ivick. So I'm gonna refresh, I'm gonna save this and hit the save and hit the back. So I'm gonna refresh this. This should automatically refresh, but you know, this prototype code by now, Mr. and refresh this, refresh and Mr. Peter Ivick. So uh, that's the idea. I'll, I'll make a demo of this whenever I release the content, which will be soon, be soon. This stuff is surprisingly easy if you're curious. I know I say things are easy all the time, but in reality, it's not that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, looks great. I mean, I hope you guys are ready. I hope you guys are ready. <laughs> yeah. Does this server API let you send push notifications to iOS devices? Um, not not the current structure that I have set up, but you can easily expand it to support push notifications. You know, just like every other company that does push notifications, they probably do it through either Twilio or uh, Amazon's SNS servers. So SNS is like secure push notifications or something. And that's that's what they do. Yeah. 
the most important thing is you need their their push notification uh the token and you just persist you just save that token into your database and you're pretty much all set yeah, or you can use uh, Firebase push notifications. Uh, really depends on, you know, the thing with technology is that there's always five, six different options that you can go with. And there's never a clear cut solution that you should pick over the other. So what you do is you just end up trying the easiest solution. And if it works, then, you know, it works. You never really want to do too much research, right? We all, we're all pretty lazy programmers and we just want to do the, the easiest thing. Um, do you agree that it's important to learn data structure and algorithm for beginners to get a job? Yes, I do. So I know a lot of people like hate data structures and algorithms. I personally, I kind of sit in the middle of that fence. Because I've seen, I've seen both sides of this equation. I've, I've obviously interviewed for jobs, and I've had to, I've had to do the whiteboard exercise. And I've also done the interviewing where I, I can give other people small algorithm questions, and if someone's not even able to pull down JSON data from a server and decode the JSON, put it inside of a list view then uh, I can't expect this person to be that productive at all. So not knowing how to pull down JSON data is just very, very easy. And you have to filter out candidates this way. Now, once they're able to pull down JSON, then you get to the harder questions like, okay, I have this tree structure, a tree of nodes. How do I traverse all these nodes and figure out uh, in all these nodes, maybe I want to add everything up in this tree. What is the sum of this tree of nodes? Uh, do you, you know, implement some kind of recursion to go through this entire tree? Yeah, probably. Uh, if you can't implement recursion, then it's not that it's an automatic fail, but if there's another candidate that can do the recursion and also do the JSON data thing, then uh, you're going to hire the guy that can do that. So it's all about competition and having to know this is it's competition. It's like, if you're talking about the MBA, right? You want to draft the person that's going to most likely give you the best of productivity. So you hire the guy that you can see that can do it all, shoot the three pointers, uh, athleticism, good defense, uh, good passing, uh, not prone to injury, all of these qualifications you have to have. And with uh, 2019, man, it's competitive. With the internet and everyone studying constantly to get a job, it's competitive out there. Uh, the other thing that you have to be pretty good at is communication. So there's a lot of us introverts in the computer science programming field. Uh, you can't you can't be introverted when you're talking about code because there's, there are some very like, uh, uh, very good communicators that can explain an algorithm down to the T. And those are the people that are really smart, intelligent, and they can really explain their ideas clearly so that other people on the team can understand. Uh, there's a lot that goes on in the hiring process. Uh, do I know the Apache stack? So I'm assuming you're talking about the LAMP stack. So the Linux, Apache, MySQL, and uh, PHP. Uh, I think everyone, almost everyone learns the LAMP stack as their first like backend technology. Is that right? I think, I think a lot of you guys are gonna agree, agree with that statement. Um, I also learned the LAMP stack a long time ago. I don't know if I prefer it. I don't like PHP, so I, I don't touch it. 
Kafka, Hadoop, and Spark. Um, I've only briefly heard of Kafka. Hadoop is probably a little more popular. Um, I've heard of Spark, but I don't know exactly what that is. Too much technology out there. Don't exactly have the time to go through everything. Um, the good thing about learning a custom backend is that you uh, most of this most of the backend terminology and the skills is like fully transferable. You learn it in one language and you just you just map it onto the other language. It's, it's, they're all very similar. You know, a git request, a post request, parsing data, storing in a database. Uh, it gets it gets pretty repetitive after a while. So developers out there, they develop these frameworks that make it easier to interact with technology. Uh, the web dev I did was Mongo Express and Node. Yep. So Mongo, there's the uh, mean and mern stacks. Mongo, Express, Node, React. Uh, I don't exactly recommend people build everything out using Express. Yeah. Express is like, it's like you go into a kitchen and then all you have is a knife, a fork, and a chopping board. And then you're expected to build everything out yourself with these three tools. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You can do it. I wouldn't recommend that you do, but you can do it. So I, I kind of prefer having a having a layer on top of everything so I don't have to interact at such a low level. And sometimes you do have to dive into the low level stuff when you need to truly customize your architecture. But if you're just starting to learn this new technology, you're probably not gonna care about the low level customizations. Um, and here's another most frequently asked question. How about server side with Swift, Vapor or Kutura? Uh Who uses that? I, I'm not trying to be facetious or anything, but I don't know any anyone that uses Vapor or Kutura. You try to learn Vapor and Kutura? I think Swift itself is just a poor backend language. Swift, you, you guys don't know this if you guys are just Swift developers, but you have to type it so much in Swift, it gets really annoying. Whatever, do a deep dive into software design and best practices. Hmm. I don't know if I'm experienced enough to dive too deeply into software design. I don't know what that course would, I don't know what the content of that course would be. How's it going everyone? One signal is a big one for push notifications, yeah. One signal, there's, um, I think Twilio does push, Amazon does push, Firebase, Google, they do push. Okay. So I said I was gonna end the stream a while ago. <laughs> we have 63 users, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what do you mean by poor back in language? What makes it poor again? Uh, Swift in general is not like, it's not the language that I would say is the most enjoyable language to, to program in. A, a couple of things wrong with Swift is that it's slow. Syntax highlighting is very buggy. 
And uh, what else is there? There's a lot of rules that you have to follow in Swift that gets kind of annoying after a while. So having a very free, loosely typed language as JavaScript, while JavaScript is like, it's kind of weird, the things that you do in this language and you, you're allowed too much freedom in JavaScript. If you know what you're doing in JavaScript, then things are really fast. How, however, like on the same coin, I know what I'm doing in Swift, but it's still very slow. Like physically typing out the code is very slow, I feel. I just hate Xcode. I don't know. Maybe if it was a different like IDE, it would be better. Xcode is just, oh my God, I can't deal with Xcode. Uh, what are my thoughts on Firebase database for handling apps similar to Grubhub? I would say that, I would say that, uh, uh, well, what do I want to say? I think Firebase is a good technology, but, uh, the moment that you want to do anything custom at all with your data, then you're like shit out of luck. That that's, that's, that's the hard, the hard truth about Firebase. Well, let's say I just want to, let's say, I, let's say I have a, a set of users that I'm storing in Firebase. And then for these users, each user has a, a list of post objects, right? And then for each one of these post objects, there's a set of images per post, maybe three or four images that each one of these posts have. And then maybe I have a bunch of people that also liked these post objects, you know, a list of a hundred or 200 people that like each one of these posts. How do I even get all the data to show up in, in my, uh, in my iOS app? Yep, do like a set of, a series of fetches to actually complete this whole thing. And I don't want my iOS app to be doing multiple fetches. It's just, it gets crazy. I don't want my iOS app to be this crazy. So having all of this custom server logic or having this custom logic in the server itself is better. And you, call, you can always modify the server quickly like I can filter the data, I can sort the data, I can do all this without the iOS app even knowing what's going on. Basically, you want your iOS apps, your Android, your front-end apps, you want them to be as dumb as possibly you can. Quit watching this channel when it got racist. <laughs> How much weight have you gained recently? Uh, so I, my weight fluctuates a lot depending on, depending on how I feel most of the time. And also depending on lighting, I think I've gotten a little bit skinnier over the past couple of months, but see if I stand it, I used to do my videos like standing up like this. So it's like very straight and it looks a little better. And now I'm just like slouching off and, you know, lighting and positioning. And also too much beer. Um, Leon Smith. So quit watching this channel when it got races. I don't even know what races means in 2019 anymore. People call everything races now that the word races means it means everything. It means nothing and everything at the same time. Um, so if you grew up as like a kid in the eighties and nineties, then the rules were different back then in the eighties and nineties. We didn't really have any rules that prevented us from saying certain things. Like for example, a, a Chinese person doing a Chinese accent on a YouTube channel 
uh, that in 2019 is not okay. Uh, in the 1990s, that's perfectly fine. Not a lot of people are going to say anything bad about it. Uh, but 2019, apparently, apparently the rules have changed. And it's strange. We live in, we live in strange times. Yeah, Postgres is good. Uh, Postgres. Uh, MySQL, Postgres, Mongo. They're all, they're all kind of the, the same thing in the beginning. It really depends on how customized you want your data to be. Then you have to decide whether or not you want to go, to, go down the Postgres route. I've always used MySQL. Um, yep. Uh, in the 90s, it don't matter black or white, but now it matters. Color people are cool and white people are guilty. Yeah. I think one thing I do want to say about this whole race topic in 2019 is that... Uh, is what? You get kind of tired of it. You get kind of tired of this race discussion. It's not very productive. People get emotional. It's very emotional, this debate. As programmers, we're very, we're very practical and pragmatic and we, don't, we shouldn't really see things from an emotional standpoint, but more of a, a rational point of view. And so I see, a lot, I see all this stuff from a very rational point of view. And so this discussion about, okay, you can't say this word, you can't say that word. These are all just words to me. Whether or not you take offense to it is kind of your problem and it's not my problem. And like, obviously there are boundaries, but people get too emotional about things. And I don't like it when people get emotional. Now, when I'm making a silly video on the channel, it's, it's all just fun and games. If you're a... And there's also like different various levels of racism. If if you're if you happen to be a Chinese person and you get offended by Chinese offensive commentary, then I I give you more credibility for being offended. But if you're a like a white American getting offended by race racial Chinese commentary then you know that doesn't deserve as much credibility for some reason that's how that's how things are and yeah people get people are really sensitive i don't know why but they are i don't care as long as something's funny as long as something's funny i'll you know we can let it slide it's funny uh, have i considered going vegan or vegetarian i have thought about like cutting cutting out a lot of the different things in my diet. But the most important thing for me was to like start going to the gym regular regularly. I used to bike, like physically bike to my office and bike home and do biking activities on the weekend for hours and hours and hours. And uh, I haven't done that in so long, so that's kind of why I weight gain. Um, yeah. If you guys are, are concerned about your own health, definitely start working out like either every, every other day or every other two days. I, I do recommend that. Um, yeah. Someone asked if I had just recently moved, uh, I moved into this like condo area for three, four months now. Um, I, I just moved the, the camera, the shooting area from uh, downstairs. At first it was up here and then it was downstairs and now it's back up here again. 
yeah, I'm constantly moving the uh, the equipment. You get kind of bored of the the space. Comp control. Why do you prefer UI design with code over storyboard? All right, we got another we got another question here. We got another uh, frequently asked question here. JavaScript is weakly typed. How do you go about committing the classes methods to your long term memory? Uh, this is currently Dublin, California. San Francisco is about 50 minutes away from here. I can still drive to San Francisco if I had the need to, but when I was living in South San Francisco, I, uh, I never even went to San Francisco. So that was always a thing for me when I was living close to San Francisco that I always told myself if I ever needed to work in San Francisco, then I can always go there and uh, get a job and, you know, provide for myself. But in the last three and a half years, I never had a need to go to San Francisco, except for like one time I went to the Firebase office and did like an interview and I did that. And, uh, I realized why don't I just move somewhere more comfortable? I was always getting sick in San Francisco because the weather over there is so horrible. Um, now I moved to Dublin, California. I like the hot weather. I grew up in the hot weather. So this is more of the environment that I'm used to. Every time I wake up, I feel, I feel excellent. I feel excellent when I wake up. I'm no longer getting sick. My voice right now might not sound the best because I just like woke up a couple of hours ago, but, uh, now I'm feeling great. I can wake up and be productive. I used to get sick, like uh, a cold or a, like the flu every other every like two weeks and it, it kind of sucked kind of sucked uh see look they reduced the price of your paid courses as a little bit costly yeah how it feels to have more than 500k in your bank account um unfortunately having 500k in your bank account even like in the bay area you can you can't even buy a house with that so if I had like $3 million in my bank account, then that would feel significantly better. But having 500K, like knowing that you can only buy like maybe half of a house with that kind of money, it, it, it's not very, it's not as big of a security net as you would hope it to be. We do always want more. It's uh, the human condition. Always wanting more and always wanting the things that you can't have. Can I get a forty thousand dollar loan? Uh, depends on what you're, what you need a loan for. Uh, am I frugal? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm frugal, but I would say that I don't buy. I don't really have a lot of like wants and desires and like physical things that I need to have. I don't really, I don't really want to buy anything. I like technology, you know, these, these cameras and microphones and TVs and computers, but all that is like relatively inexpensive nowadays. Um, like, you know, I don't go buy like fancy cars and grocery or not grocery bag, but uh, designer bags. Um, the only thing that I, I do enjoy is like living in a comfortable like space. So right now I have this entire space to do work. It's very comfortable and it also in increases productivity for the channel and the website, which is great. I, I like, I like doing this. This is totally worth it. How do you post your courses on your website? Do you use another service? Uh, so for all of the things that I post on my website, if you guys aren't experienced in this stuff, you basically, you have a, you have a website, right? You have the front end. And then for all of the content management, you can, you can either install some kind of service or you just build it out yourself. So I just built out, I built out the uh, content management system for uploading courses and you know, emailing newsletters to you guys and what else? Like checking up on, you know, sales and whatnot. You just build out all this stuff. It's, it's not that easy. It's mostly just 
pulling data from the database and presenting it in some kind of you know HTML page. After a while, you you really feel like, why am I learning iOS development? Doing HTML is just so much easier. iOS is unnecessarily hard. Uh, Sony A7 III is expensive. Uh, the chat and the tenor course, if someone had to scale only the chat portion, will that be scalable? Yeah, it should be. So the chat, the code that I wrote in the Tinder chat, that code isn't really listening for a lot. So it's like monitoring very little amount of information. If you have a like a thousand different uh, users, let me think about this one. If you have even 10,000 users, every app is just listening for that one node. And when things change in that node, then that one user will be notified. So it scales, it's like an O of N scale. Just, it scales with the amount of users that you have. Um, obviously the costs are going to increase as you have more users. And this is the problem that you you do want to have. You want to have your server costs go up due to having more users. Um, earning 500K US dollars makes you one of the top 0.2% richest people in the world by income. Um, yeah, that's a really misleading stat. It's very misleading when you like you, you see you, you yeah, I, I get I get what you're saying, but you know, everything's relative in this world. Everything's relative, unfortunately. Yeah. So what do I mean by just doing HTML? Uh, so HTML development, there seems to be a lot of a lot more jobs for like being a React JS developer. It's easier. Uh, I don't think the pay is as high, but being a web developer it seems to be easier, and the opportunities there seem to be more. However. Uh, you know, not everyone wants to work with the web. I think being a mobile developer is more, is more fun being a mobile developer. It's not as vanilla as being a React developer. Uh, no, I don't have any children. If I had children, I, I wouldn't be able to do this right now. Um, yeah. Okay, I am going to end the uh, live stream here today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me and just talking and babbling for the last, what is it, two hours and seven minutes. Thanks for uh, spending the time with me. I hope you guys are um, taking, your, taking your time to learn iOS development. Remember, Swift UI, new technology, Things come out and it's always new. Don't worry about it. You don't have to learn it now. It's still in beta. And it's not gonna be in production for like, I don't know, a year. A year, right? At least a year. So don't worry about it too much. And I'll see you guys probably uh, next week. Um, thanks again for joining me 